Welcome to the Lessons from the Great Coaches podcast. I've learned that you don't do it alone. You learn so many different things from so many different coaches. That's an elite learning environment. Failure is not a problem. How you deal with it is a problem. How to be resilient. How important it is to infuse joy in the process of learning. To be a good coach, you've got to give more than you take. What an interesting life it is to be a leader. Hello and welcome to the Great Coaches Podcast, where we believe that there is no algorithm for leadership, and so we interview great sports coaches from around the world to try and find ideas to help all of us lead our families, our colleagues, and our teams better. As the podcast has grown, the great coaches we have interviewed have shared so much insight and wisdom that we decided to create episodes dedicated entirely to the ideas that have resonated with us the most. Today's episode is on the topic of thriving teams. And just before we go to the interview, today's podcast is brought to you by the Macquarie University Business School's MBA program. Designed to empower, challenge and transform, the Macquarie MBA gives you the business skills and knowledge you need to succeed in an evolving global economy. The program bridges the gap between theory and real-world application, bringing together world-leading professors, executives, and industry partners to teach you how business can be used for good. I have just started working with the team at Macquarie on some projects and can attest to the quality of the people and material. To find out more, search for Macquarie University Business School's MBA. You're listening to the Lessons from the Great Coaches podcast. In 2022, I was lucky enough to catch up with two of the great coaches we have interviewed on the podcast over a coffee, Eddie Jones and Neil Craig. And as we got up to leave, they challenged me with an idea. So many sports coaches write books, and in them, they have models to illustrate what they think high-performing teams do. Why not compare these models against what the coaches I was interviewing were actually saying? It was an interesting idea that stayed with me afterwards. And then in early 2023, I found some time to do this. Not only did I look at high-performing team models from coaches, I also looked at ones from academics and consultants. I printed them all off, laid them out on the table, and started to compare them against the Insight database that we have built up from the podcast interviews. The database has 1,500 one- to two-minute videos from the coaches and is coded into buckets like culture, communication, and mental skills. The database itself can be accessed on our website, thegreatcoachespodcast.com. After going through this exercise, the model that I thought best reflected the messages I was hearing from the great coaches was the Thriving Teams model, developed by the consultancy Thompson Harrison in conjunction with the Oxford University professor Robin Dunbar. Their model builds from the idea that organisations only thrive when people do, and they identify six dimensions that enable this, belonging, purpose, connection, culture, values, and learning. Their model was the best fit based on three key things. The first was they're focused on thriving as opposed to just performing. Secondly, the focus they place on belonging and purpose, which I think is a factor that has risen in importance post the pandemic as teams become even more dispersed and separate from each other. And thirdly, the weight they place on learning. In this podcast, I will introduce their model to you using audio from the great coaches to bring it to life. You're listening to our episode on Thriving Teams. In successful organisations, people thrive. Here is basketball coach Rob Beveridge explaining this. You know, when you look at the really successful organisations, they look after their staff. You know, so they they recruit really good people that are really good at their jobs and you empower them to do their jobs. So, you know, I I, I believe that, you know, you put your players in a really good, positive, fun, healthy uh, culture that they're going to thrive. But what does thriving mean? 
based on what I have heard from the great coaches and the social science research I've read, thriving is a state where your well-being and development path is optimised. For a team, it means both optimising the outcomes they're delivering today and the development they're undertaking to prepare them for the future. Here is the Olympic gold medal field hockey coach, Barry Dancer, expressing this very idea. I think firstly, um, fundamentally my hope was in the environment that I created with others is that people could grow, people could thrive, people could at the end be better people for the experience of living in that environment, working with those people. Um, And I suppose the hope I had also was that some of the things we did in my time with other people in creating that culture was about setting some cultural norms Um, that better positioned the program for other people to take it on to another level. One of the best definitions of the word thriving that I read was the joint experience of development and success. And achieving this is at the forefront of the leadership focus for great coaches. The best example of this comes from world championship winning basketball coach Jan Sterling who encapsulates the best definition of leadership that represents the many great coaches that we have interviewed. How can you stay on task and stay focused and do your job and focused on what you need to do and still be true to yourself and still true to the playing group and still deliver on your values and behaviours in the best possible way while you're in this quadrum of chaos? And that's when I think good leaders stand whole true is they can still function appropriately, lead, and more importantly, be influential leaders. Everyone can lead, but can you influence others? The first focus area for thriving teams is belonging. We are members of many teams in life. They could be groups at work, for example, the supply chain team. They could be sporting teams like our Tuesday night basketball team, or in a community, you might be part of a scouts group or a church organisation or even a charity group. And our attachment to these groups is not equal. I used to think that it was natural to feel most attached to the teams in which you have the highest status. But I now think you feel most attached to teams where you feel like you most belong. And in teams where we feel like we belong, we are most comfortable in being our true, authentic self. Here is rugby union coach Dan McKellar expressing this idea. And you, you do need to reflect and have those thoughts. So what, what's what's going to make me me feel better? What's going to make me feel like I belong um, to this to this team, to this to this to this organisation? I think um, you know you get that from your own leaders as well. I know certainly at the Brumbies, Phil Thompson was the CEO there. Um, you know, someone who'd always just check in on uh, on, on how how I was doing. Um, how my family would be doing, how my daughters had settled into high school, whatever it might be, what were they up to in sport, and uh, and just know, and just knowing that it's re- that it's really genuine. I think that's 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 critical, and, and it all comes back to just feeling like you belong within that particular room or or environment or team or or organisation. And, and I think once you've got that, then you can just be yourself. You can be yourself as a as a human being, and and we all know, you know, it's no like we're most comfortable in our own homes. Why are we most comfortable in our own homes? Because we know we can be ourselves with our with our, with our wives, with our partner, with with our kids, whoever whoever it may be. The job of leaders is to make sure that they create environments where people are able to be this kind of person. And the iconic softball coach Sue Enquist explain this idea to us quite eloquently using a house party analogy. I always tell leaders, I often say, think about leadership like you're hosting a party. And when you host a party, you provide everything, even the things you don't like. Like, okay, here are the veggies. I hate veggies. I love candy. So I've got veggies and candy and meat for the party. The minute someone walks in, you're there to grab the door and welcome them in. Why aren't we doing that in the athletic field? Why aren't we doing that in corporate America? Why aren't we grabbing that new employee and saying, hey, I hope we have everything here for you. 
We see you. We want you to be comfortable and safe because when people feel safe, they'll go for it when it comes to courage. I think this idea of Sue's is very important as we retain the emotional feeling of a first experience for a long time. And a sense of belonging motivates us, and this motivation helps us look forward. And this becomes important when the team faces pressure, like many teams did in the pandemic and are facing again now, given the situation with world supply chains that are being interrupted and the escalation of inflation. Listening to the great coaches, I leave with the feeling that our sense of identity within a group is developed through our sense of feeling that we belong. And when that is in place, we move beyond just providing a service or playing a role to caring about the purpose that the group has. And so it's a key building block in generating motivation. The second focus area for thriving teams is purpose. Collaboration is enhanced when people are united against a common purpose. The purpose must be something that the people in the team believe in and be something they realise cannot be achieved without united effort. What I also like about purpose is that it is an enabler of thriving. Here is the World Cup winning cricket coach, Gary Kirsten, talking about this idea. And I think the guys started to enjoy that because they started to feel there's a bigger purpose here, you know. Um, And I think all teams thrive when they when they operate not teams organizations groups of people they thrive when they feel connected to that bigger purpose um and i think we were able to create that with the indian team the bigger purpose became more relevant than the name on the back of the shirt the team's purpose should be connected to the overall organization's purpose if it's to truly harness the energy of the broader group And finding this connection is a critical task of all teams when they come together. One task of the team leader is to provide the challenge necessary to ensure that this link is established. With the team's purpose in place and connected to the organisations, then comes the task of ensuring that the individual feels connected to this idea by identifying a link with their own individual purpose. What emerges from any discussion about purpose with the great coaches, though, is the idea of building a relationship with the athlete that is built from an understanding of what that individual's purpose is, or as they sometimes call it, their why. Because it's from here that they have this belief that a partnership can be built between coach and athlete that unlocks energy and potential. A great example of this idea comes from basketball coach Natasha Adair. I'm a player's coach. I want our players because it's not just my job and our staff's job to coach them on the basketball court. We're going to coach them for life. And I can't coach them to their why if I don't know who they are, if I don't know what, why they're doing this, if I, if I don't know about their family or what's important to them. And so we ask, I ask those questions in recruiting. I ask those questions when they get here. I constantly ask, why? Why? What is your commitment to this game? What is your commitment? Why are you doing this? And you hear so many things over the years. I'm doing it for my family. I'm doing it for my mom. I'm doing it for, for, my, for my family's name. I'm doing it because I want to I wanna take care of my family. I'm doing it for the love of the game. I'm doing it, coach, because I'm enough. I was told growing up that I wasn't going to be or I couldn't do it. And I'm doing it to prove people wrong. So you have a team of 15 scholarship, you know, student athletes, all 15 of them, each person, they're playing this game for a different reason. And if I'm only going in with my standards and my expectations, I'm going to miss. And everyone, you and I, everyone wants to be heard. They want to feel needed. And they want to feel appreciated and valued. And for me, it's just, it works. When they know I'm coaching them to their why, they say, wow, coach heard me. She's listening. I matter. And it doesn't mean I lose sight of our foundation. I lose sight of the culture or the standards in which we will play with. But if they know that they matter, 
You know how hard they're going to fight for their team and their sisters. And when everyone knows each other's why collectively, they're going to help. They're going to push. They're going to encourage. They're going to motivate. Finding the link between the organization, team, and individual's purpose takes time and effort that it's easy to think might be better spent developing skills that are required to execute every day. But the payoff from finding these linkages is better resilience and energy, factors that become so important when hard times inevitably come. It's the purpose that creates the team. It's the uniting idea that everyone has a stake in fulfilling. Purpose then becomes a very powerful form of motivation, one that is hard to replace with financial rewards alone. It drives engagement and builds trust and doesn't have to be earth-shattering in the way it's described to make an impact. Sometimes just merely asking, what is the purpose of this team, is enough. The third focus area for thriving teams is connection. The work you do on building belonging and creating a sense of purpose is kept alive through ensuring the connections within the group remain strong. As the cricket coach Justin Langer said to us, camaraderie is the glue that keeps everything together. I always, I've always said as a player that the camaraderie within a group is like the glue that keeps everything together, particularly when the pressure comes on. And it's, it's something I hope we never, ever lose. Um, you know, that whole feeling, it, it helps in life, but it, and it helps certainly in a sporting team. And on the flip side of that, if you get cracks in that, you quickly get exposed. For this kind of team interaction to happen, there has to be an understanding that teammate relations are critical to success. And investing in these relationships is a key task. And this requires you to understand that being a teammate is often more important than friendship. This is an idea that Hugh McCutcheon, the gold medal winning volleyball coach, spoke to us about. And then second of all, I think in team sports anyway, they've got to trust their teammates. And so I'm a big believer in giving um, you know, the, the, the team relationships some boundaries and some structure. Um, so, you know, I think it's important that teammates are friendly, for example, but we don't need everyone to be best friends. And in fact, the idea that we would all be best friends is probably a little, at the very least, naive. But we can be respectful and inclusive and, and direct and honest and, and all of these things that I think are really important for developing trust because there's some authenticity in those relationships that we need. And just to you know, take that in a little bit further extension, it doesn't mean that we're not friends. It just means that we're not requiring it. The connections within the team sustain it and keep it functioning through the competitive and pressure situations it faces. The strength of these connections are often described through words like chemistry or cohesion and yet do not have to be left to chance. It can be built and sustained through careful and deliberate focus. The fourth focus area for thriving teams is values. The fourth component of thriving teams is an articulation of their values. These become the foundation of the shared standards and principles the team will aspire to. Many times we have heard great coaches talk about their values and how they shape them as a leader. But what's important in teams is that these values are co-created together. In this way, they become something more authentic than just being the personal beliefs of the leader. A great example of the importance of thinking like this comes from rugby union coach Andy Friend. Yeah, and it was a great lesson. It, you know, it was a, it was a, it's, a, it's a tough lesson because you know you don't want to lose your job. But uh, and there was a lot of things transpired in me losing my job there. But as I said, you know, I definitely, as a young coach, I came in and I said, "Here's." Here's what I believe are the five key values we should live in, and, and they're good values. The, the issue was they were anti friend, friends' values. They weren't the values of the team. So my great learn out of that, I'm still very values-driven. I still have my own values, but I don't try and enforce them upon a group. It has to be the group that finds its own way. 
And what tends to happen is, you know, the, the, the group, if you're, a, if you're the leader of the group um, and you live the values that you, you talk about, um, that, that comes through in everything you do. So they pick up on that. People are, people are you know, they're smart. They, they work that out. So um, you don't actually have to verbalise them. With these values in place for the team, a great example of teams coming together to understand them comes from American football coach Jeff Trailer. Jeff speaks about values being the pillars of the team culture and how they spend time each year at the start of the new season coming together to reflect on them. I thought this example was a very powerful one, as when new people join teams, they have to act their way into a culture. And without understanding what the team's values are, this can be difficult and unpredictable. Well, if they'll be back Tuesday in our first team meeting, our first culture pillar is integrity. So I will walk in the meeting. Everybody will sit up with their notes out. I will say the word integrity and they'll scream back to me all at once. Win the day. That's really our main culture pillars to win the day. This would be the best we can be every day. So then I'm going to do a 10 to 15 minute presentation on what integrity means to me. Uh, we'll break up from that team meeting. Our special teams coordinator will speak on integrity. We'll break up into offense and defense. The offense and defense coordinator will speak on integrity. Uh, then we'll break into players' position meetings, and there'll be a player from each group speak on integrity. And then at the end of practice, another player will speak on integrity. We do that every day the whole week. So then the next week we go to passion. So that's the second culture pillar. So I'll walk in the team room. I'll say passion. They'll scream back, win the day. And uh, I'll teach on passion for 10 or 15 minutes. And then not to bore you, but we'll follow that exact same plan on passion. We work our way through every culture pillar. And we just try to – and I'll tell you what else we do a good job of, Paul, is holding those kids accountable. We vote – our single-digit guys are the guys that best represent our culture pillars, and the guys that were the two, the one, and the zero are the ones that had the most votes. And uh, so we do do a really good job of holding them accountable. Well, what I would say, Paul, is every coach in the country has words on a wall. Uh, We challenge our kids to not have words on a wall, but words in our hearts. And uh, we we really want, you know, our heart to be shown, you know, through our words instead of just having – Every coach has got culture builders, Paul. It's not like I invented this. Everybody's got them. When you have these values in place, they inform the behaviour and standards that are important to the team. In this example, the Australian cricket coach John Buchanan explains how it's not just the leader's job to call out standards that are not acceptable. It's everyone's in the team. And that achieving this leads to you becoming a more powerful unit. One is the cliche about, you know, the standards you walk past are the standards you accept. And that, that's so true, and that links to everybody's a leader. And that's something I really believe in, that while the leaders have got to walk the walk and talk the talk, you know, lead by example, etc. cetera, um, you know, leadership is in everybody. And, and therefore, if there is something not right, then it is everybody's responsibility to do something about that. And the more people that are doing that, the more mature and the more powerful that unit becomes as a group that can produce success, produce high performance. To close this section on values, though, just a word on not forgetting the individual. In 1981, a political scientist named Ronald Inglehart, started measuring the values of people around the world. His research continues on to this day, and what the survey started to uncover in 2021 was a shift away from religious and family values towards more secular beliefs, and in parallel, a shift away from in-group thinking towards self-expression in many Western and Latin American countries. This is important because at the same time, you are trying to build an appreciation for the team's values. People will feel a need to also express themselves. This is why the work on belonging that you do with the team and the locking in of a sense of purpose becomes so important before you get to values. 
It's also why as a leader, you will need to work to understand the values of the people you're leading so that you're able to help them achieve their own goals as well as the team's. The fifth focus area for thriving teams is learning. Earlier, I described thriving teams as optimizing the outcomes they are delivering today and the development they are undertaking to prepare them for the future. In order for them to achieve this, they must be able to capture learning at a faster rate than the change that is occurring around them. Learning happens at both an individual and a team level. And yet in either instance, it begins with examining your past in order to find better ideas to propel you forward. Here is the iconic swimming coach, Bill Sweetenham, expressing this idea. That's what I think as a coach you have to do. As a coach, you have to invest in your past to see your future. So if you don't invest in your past, it's not possible to see your future. In other words, if you make mistakes all through your coaching career and you don't change and you don't improve, then nothing, nothing good comes of it. You have to, have to address improvement even when it hurts. You have to be brave enough to address it. Helene Wilson is a championship winning netball coach in New Zealand, as well as now working for High Performance Sport New Zealand. She builds on Bill's ideas by describing the action learning cycle that she advocates. I think um, as human beings as well, action learning, I'm a great advocate for the action learning cycle. So you have to action, you have to do something first and you have to reflect on it. You have to figure out you know, what worked, what didn't, what did I notice? And then you need to just tweak it a bit and go back out and give it another try. But within that action learning cycle, you also have to make sure you're getting quality feedback. And the quality feedback comes from the critical conversations that you have with the people around you. And critical conversations have robustness to them. They're not just telling you what you want to hear. They don't always sound um, nice or feel good. But if you have a mutual respect and trust within in what you do, I think that active learning process is really critical. The process of debriefing post-performance and looking for lessons to learn from is a crucial task that is often well-structured in thriving teams. The Australian rules football coach Neil Craig discusses this idea here using the description of an elite learning environment. A lot of it is about just you've got to experience it, you debrief it, can, how do we do it get, Do it better? Uh, and the next time that we, we get that experience, can we do it better? Um, you, know, you don't go looking for adversity because it will find you. you don't, in, a, in elite sport, it will find you. You don't have to go looking for it. So the time will come again when you will get another opportunity and we need to do it better. And that's, that's your learning environment, you see. That's where the learning environment becomes. So don't uh, you don't back off in terms of adversity. In actual fact, you actually clap your hands and say, okay, here it is. Beautiful. Here's another opportunity. Thank God for that. Uh, how, and let's see how we handle that. Now, that's, that's an elite learning environment um, because you value the lessons and you, uh, yeah, you value the lessons that you're going to learn and the skill set you're going to develop by being challenged in, in a whole range of different areas. Dr. Carol Dweck coined the terms fixed and growth mindset. And her research showed that a growth mindset empowers people to believe they can develop their abilities. It's not surprising then that many of the great coaches identify the presence of a growth mindset as being essential for the execution of people's roles. But it's also important to note that a growth mind state isn't static. It can change with energy and motivation. But bringing team members back to this mindset is part of what thriving teams do well. Corey Close coaches basketball at UCLA in America. And in her team, a growth mindset is so important that it is one of the three core values in her team. This is not something I do like, okay, every month I do X, Y, and Z. Like this is a lifestyle choice to constantly be learning, ask more questions, give less answers, to have a humility of of what can I learn from the person to my right or to my left, really, despite any titles or anything else, to just make the lifestyle choice 
to be a consummate learner. And so that's really what I'm trying to do. And I want to model for our players. One of our three core values in our program here with UCLA women's basketball is a growth mindset. And what does that mean? It means everything that happens to me today is an opportunity to learn and grow. And I want every player as they leave our program to have a deep sense of what a privilege it is to look at life through the lens of growth and not through a fixed mindset lens. And if I want them to really adopt that, I've got to model it myself. I've got to show them my pride in being better today than I was yesterday. And when I fall short, owning that and saying, hey, you know what? I fell short here. I made a mistake here. Let's get back onto the growth path. And perhaps the final word on learning should come from Justin Langer, who offered curiosity as the one piece of advice he would like to leave the audience in our interview. And if I could give people one bit of advice at any age, have a curious mind and and search for mentors. And a lot of people, the mistake they make is they think they already know it all and they don't ask questions. And I've said this for many, many years. I hope in the last day of my coaching career, I still consider myself as a novice coach. In other words, I hope I'm still learning. The sixth focus area for thriving teams is culture. Peter Drucker was an American management and organisational theorist and is credited with the quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. It's one of those often repeated phrases that no one can directly attribute to Drucker, but which is now in popular culture. What the term infers is that a good culture can deliver results far in excess of what strategy alone can. And culture is the sixth and final part of thriving teams. The word culture comes up frequently in our interviews with the great coaches, and they use it to describe the environment that surrounds the group. Here is the rugby union coach, Connor O'Shea. I think culture is more the environment you create, and the environment you create is the people in it. And yes, you talk about values and all these other things, but it's creating an environment creates a culture. Defining this environment is something that is not easy to do. The theme we often hear repeated is that it is intangible. But as the netball coach Tamsin Greenway points out, it's a place where you want to be because it brings out the best in you. One of the questions we ask the great coaches we interview is, how would you go about building culture in an organisation? And the starting point they often identify is setting a vision. Here is the world record holding cricket coach, John Buchanan. For me, the starting point is about well, where is it that we're going to go? You know, where we want to be as a, as a group, and, and so that's kind of the vision stuff. So, so I said we're going to go on this journey to Everest together, and of course that conjures up certain symbols in terms of being at the top of the world, and you know, not too many people can get there. Um, it requires teamwork, hard work risk, planning, etc. all those sorts of adjectives. Many of the great coaches we interview talk about regularly reviewing their team culture so that they can understand what needs to be strengthened in order to improve performance. Here is Sandy Brondello, who coaches in the WNBA in America, talking about how she approaches this. So every year um, before I start a season, I, I get the players on and, and I talk about, okay, what's important for us to be the best team that we could be. And it's driven by the team. It's not, I'm not a dictator coach. I'm not, you know, we're going to do this, 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 because then I wouldn't have buy-in. It just doesn't work now. Maybe it worked many, many years ago, but it just doesn't work now. So it's more like, okay, what culture do we need? Um, what are the, what's important for us to be the best team that we could be. And obviously you always hear about, you know, and this is driven by the players. So I'm taking notes and, okay, you know, I let them all talk and, uh, you know, accountability is always up there. You know, so it's like, okay, you want accountability. So that they want that. So that makes my job easier. Um, look, I, I'm, uh, like I said, I'm a very positive coach, but then I, when I need to get on them, I can because, well, this is what we have agreed on. So, you know, when it's driven by team values, I think that makes my job um, easier. Culture is the place 
where the work you do in the other five elements we have discussed become visible. The great coaches go on to describe culture in very broad ways. They include things like symbols, influence structures, behaviours, stories, routines and systems. And in each instance, they strive for ways to measure and understand so that they can continue to move towards a state where the team is thriving. You're listening to our episode on Thriving Teams. To close this episode on Thriving Teams, I want to bring it back to the individual. After interviewing so many great coaches, I am firmly of the belief that teams thrive when people do. We've looked at the six dimensions needed in any team for this to occur. They are belonging, purpose, connection, values, learning and culture. And there was one interview in particular where the impact of aligning these areas on performance was described so well. And it comes from the World Cup winning cricket coach, Gary Kirsten. And I just think if you can get close to that as a, as a coach of, of a group of people where individuals in your team can really be fairly open around just where they are as human beings and, there's, and you build some trust in that, I think you then allow that expression of talent and they, that expression of, of this is who I am as a human being. And if, if I'm in this team because you think I've got some talent and you allow me to express myself in my abilities as a, as a human being in, in a very powerful way, I think you can achieve a lot. Yes, there are frameworks that we all have to work in because you're part of teams. So it's not just about this is not your own show and you just do what you want to do. I think there are frameworks. Um, but it's wonderful to see that real um, expression of an individual in a team where he's really thriving in that environment because he can be who he needs to be within the framework of, of what the team requirements are. I hope you enjoyed this podcast on thriving teams and found a few ideas that you can bring back to your own team for discussion. In the coming weeks, I'm going to explore the idea of thriving teams further with the help of Professor Eric Knight, who is the Executive Dean of the Macquarie Business School. Eric and I are going to interview team leaders together and try to delve deeper into the six key areas of thriving teams. So Eric, welcome to the podcast. Great to be here, Paul. Eric, what are you hoping that we get out of this, this journey together? looking into thriving teams over the coming month or so? Well, I think um, we're going to be able to meet some really fascinating people who've had some really interesting experiences. And the value that I always take away from these conversations, Paul, is the chance to reflect on how their experiences resonate with our own life um, in teams and in, inside organisations, chipping away at things. And is there anything in particular you're looking forward to digging into a little bit more than perhaps any other area? Um, you know, I think about how do you build the set of uh, values and um, that sense of camaraderie within teams is something I'm really interested in. You know, I was recently reading this fantastic book called Scaling People by Claire Hughes Johnson, who was the chief operating officer at um, a, a financial payments company called Stripe, which is a massive company. And she made the point that Almost everything we accomplish is never done as an individual leader. It's always done as a team. Teams are the underlying operating um, function of the modern economy. And so I'm really looking forward to understanding the dynamics behind how teams work. Well, we'll kick it off next week with our first interview with the former Australian and now netball coach over in Wales, Jill McIntosh. And I guess from there, we'll spread out over the coming weeks and interview some you know, what I hope will be interesting people from around the world. It's going to be fantastic. Look forward to it, Paul. Thanks, Eric. If you'd like to know more about thriving teams and how to move your team closer to becoming one, we've developed some tools for you. We have a survey that you can take to see where your team sits on the six key areas of a thriving team, and it's applicable for all teams, not just sporting ones. We have also developed some workshops on thriving teams that can be delivered either virtually or live. And in some of those workshops, we can include the participation of some of the great coaches we have interviewed. 
we also offer individual coaching for leaders who want to move their teams closer to thriving. All the details on these tools and on how to connect with us are in the show notes. And as always, just before I go, please let us know if you have any feedback. Just like Steve Berglund, who said, I loved the episode with Jeremy Gunn. I played for him at Fort Lewis College, his first year as a head coach in 1999. Thank you for doing that interview. It was a pleasure listening to it. Thanks, Steve. We love the interaction with the people around the world who listen. And so if you have any feedback or comments, please let us know. And if they're positive ones, then please let your friends know too. All the details on how to connect with us are in the show notes or on our website, thegreatcoachespodcast.com.